Welcome to Silver Oaks Quarterly Webinar. My name is Shannon King, and I am President, Partner, and Chief Compliance Officer of Silver Oak. With me today, as usual, is Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for joining. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Jonathan's a partner with Silver Oak and also our lead analyst. So today's webinar is scheduled to last approximately 45 to 60 minutes. A copy of the materials will be posted to our website afterwards, usually within a few days. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to contact your Silver Oak advisor after the session. If you're not currently working with an advisor here at Silver Oak, feel free to contact me directly at 952-896-5701. And as usual, I wanna thank Jonathan and John and the rest of the team for making today's webinar possible. It really does take a village to pull this off. Uh, hopefully it looks so smooth, it seems easy, but behind the scenes, it's not. And since I am the compliance officer uh, for cl compliance purposes, I must note that we will be discussing the overall markets and economy during today's webinar. In doing so, we will be providing our interpretations and perspectives. You should not rely upon this information as fact when making any investment decisions. Also, we're not going to be discussing specific Silver Oak portfolio performance as each of our client portfolios are customized. Nonetheless, all of our clients should have received by now their performance reports. Um, and Certainly, if you have any questions regarding those, feel free to contact your Silver Oak advisor if they have not already reached out to you. And lastly, as everyone knows, past performance is no guarantee of future success. So with that, Jonathan, let's talk about today's agenda. And as usual, we're gonna split the agenda into various components, first starting with economic data for the past quarter and past year. We'll look at then market data for both time periods. Then we're gonna transition into a discussion that, that's really, I think, high on everybody's radar these days, and that is inflation and rising interest rates. We'll give you a little bit of our perspective on the outlook as we move forward throughout this new year. And with it being the beginning of a new year, Jonathan, we get to go through our new year planning tips again. Um, and also we're happy to provide some Silver Oak updates. Again, if you have any questions, we encourage you to reach out to us afterwards. And that includes, by the way, topics for future discussion. So Jonathan, starting on the economy, you indicate here the recovery continues uh, really despite the pandemic. So in prior webinars, we've just talked about the pandemic and how it seems to have really shaped the economy and the markets, and that's continued. Obviously, everyone knows that for the second half of the year, we were dealing with the Delta uh, variant, and then late in the fourth quarter, uh, Omicron came out, um, and that has had an effect. Yes, and we're gonna talk more about that throughout today's discussion. But as we look here at the market dashboard, and we're gonna start really kind of from a big picture perspective, um, from an economic perspective on the dashboard, the data is still positive. Um, is there anything specific as it relates to the economy that you want to touch on here? No, the economy is still, you know, very positive. We'll, uh, on the next slide, you know, look at where the composite uh, and the six month is, but to, to a certain extent, uh, the economic factors are just off a little bit from their highs, but still very strong. Okay, and those factors include like the leading indicators, housing sector, employment, things of that nature. As we look at the credit markets, we've indicated here they also remain positive and our forecast is that they'll continue to remain positive for the next quarter. But the one area that's been negative 
shown here in the red is valuations. Now, maybe that's less red today uh, after the last couple of weeks um, as we turned the new year. Uh, maybe the markets have turned a little bit as well, but, uh, but still we consider them to be high valuations, which means negative uh, overall. And the last component of our, comp our composite or the dashboard is market sentiment. Um, and that also has remained positive. Uh, have, we, have we seen any shift more recently in the market sentiment? Yeah, absolutely. Many of the surveys of, of sentiment have actually come down a little bit. And I think that has been really because of the pandemic, Delta, and now Omicron. And so consumer confidence, while still relatively high, has come down a little bit. Sure. So as you mentioned, the composite is shown here. Still positive, but as you're going to see in this next slide, it has come down a bit. Absolutely. So if we look at the green, which is right in the circle, you'll see that it's come down in the last quarter. And really the largest factor in that slight decrease was the fact that consumer sentiment has come in. And again, due to the pandemic. Uh, the other small factor, which we talked about on the economy, is that GDP um, forecasts have come down a little bit. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when we look at the six-month uh, index, that is uh, just slightly off of its highs. So you've touched on uh, briefly GDP, so let's let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, and, and what a chart this is. I mean, it's very, very clear uh, to see when COVID hit um, and the impact, the dra dramatic impact it had on GDP. But we also saw a sharp increase in GDP. So there was a sharp decrease and, and then a, a big bounce off of the bottom, uh, putting us almost to what was pre-pandemic trend line. Well, and surprisingly, when we look at uh, the forecast for GDP in the fourth quarter being up maybe a little less than 7%, once that's announced, we'll be at trend line. Hmm. And so it's just interesting, you know, where we've talked about the pandemic, if you looked at uh, the GDP line and, and took out the dip, you wouldn't even know that it happened. And when we get to the markets, I mean, that's essentially what we've seen in the markets as well. If you took out that March to whatever, June timeframe of 2020, you probably wouldn't have even noticed the uh, pandemic. Yeah, so absolutely. It was kind of the sharpest, shortest recession, one of the fastest recoveries, as you mentioned with the market, fastest bear market, fastest uh, recovery of, of a bear yeah, market. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, GDP potentially being down a little bit because of Omicron and such. Um, I've also heard that there's concerns with Omicron potentially driving up inflation a little further, and we're going to touch on that later in today's uh, conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So first quarter GDP estimates are down a little bit in the last couple of days uh, as a result of both factors. Perfect. Well, actually not perfect. We don't really like that, but, no. <laughs> but again, still, it, it's yeah. still good growth. That, fair. Yeah, that's, that's a fair comment. So if we look here um, on this next slide, we're going to see our economic factors in the scorecard. And what we're going to see is that of all of the various factors we follow on this scorecard, really only threes, three of them have changed kind of overall sentiment. Uh, we've got monetary policy, uh, hasn't shifted from positive to the neutral category, but the sentiment is certainly down. Um, as our interest rates, or at least the sentiment on interest rates, rates aren't actually down, rates are up, but that's pushing the sentiment a little bit down. Uh, anything on those two that you want to touch on, Jonathan? Well, I think it, it, the bottom line is that the Fed is normalizing its policy. You know, prior to kind of the fall, they were still trying to act against the pandemic. But then inflation started to increase, and so they dropped transitory. 
as an example. But the interplay between all of three of these is, is fairly obvious. And, and so as the Fed this year moves to taper bond purchases, and then later on, the, the viewpoint is there will be at least three Fed hikes that will impact uh, interest rates. And they hope, and we'll have to see, and we'll talk about this later, that that will help moderate inflation. So you'll see on the far right of this, we've actually shifted inflation from neutral to the negative category um, as a result of, of exactly what Jonathan has just explained. And we'll see here on this next slide that there's no question inflation has increased. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've talked about this before, but one of the biggest factors in the increase uh, this past year has been energy. Um, energy prices will likely increase this year, but probably not at that same extent. But there are other factors that still could be persistent. Food, as an example, uh, food prices are up, everyone knows that, but because energy prices are up, fertilizer prices are up and also in short supply. And so that could uh, cause food prices this year uh, to be a bit persistent in terms of inflation. And, and back to the Omicron, comment, uh, the fact that that is having in, uh, well, in the U.S. a bit, but certainly more so overseas, impacts on supply chain. Uh, we're seeing, especially in China and other countries that are taking kind of a zero tolerance stance on Omicron, that uh, manufacturing is being shut down again, uh, shipping is being impacted. Uh, so that all really was one of the main catalysts of inflation to start with that could make that inflation concern a little bit more persistent um, rather than, as you mentioned, the transitory um, type of, of common. Yeah, and in, in fact, in the most recent purchase, Purchasing Managers Index uh, report, they said that we're in a demand-driven but supply-constrained environment, and it, it's getting the basic raw materials. It's it's the trucking of, of mm -hmm. even finish, the finished goods getting um, to, to the right markets. That's going to be an issue this year right. still. And we really didn't touch on it today, um, and we can in a future session, but that's uh, also impacting wage inflation. Right? We're right now talking about more price inflation, but when you mentioned trucking, you know, there's a real shortage of, 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 of people um, in all industries. And so we're seeing wage inflation. I think Goldman put out that their wage inflation uh, last year was 30 some percent um, as you know, several other investment banks were up 10 to 15 percent on wage inflation. So um, we can come back to that and, and discuss that in a future discussion if it looks like that wage inflation is going to be persistent. We certainly have seen a rise in expectations um, and I want to delineate you know this last slide that we were looking at was showing kind of the factual price inflation um, here this is showing expectations and and what i was astounded by is not necessarily the increase in expectations of consumers uh, which we have seen a big increase but it's that differential between what consumers believe and what kind of the professional forecasters believe. Uh, that's quite a wide disparity, and, and it generally tends to be wide, but but certainly getting wider. And, and certainly when you look at economists and, and the Fed themselves, it's the expectations that they're worried about because it can be persistent, it can cause more wage inflation, and then you kind of get into a vicious cycle. Right. Now, the good news is bringing it kind of bigger picture, even though it spiked here recently, it is still relatively within the average range over the last, you know, 20 some years. Um, but we would be monitoring this uh, a lot more closely. So longer term earnings really are the fuel for the market. And so one of the things that I think is, is just really remarkable, and again, I think this has to do with the pandemic, is if you look at the green uh, bars, those are periods where we were in lower earnings or what we call earnings recessions uh, 
and, and in the past, it took two, three, four years uh, to recover. But this time around in 2021, not only did we recover to old highs in one year, we actually went far into new highs. And then on top of that, we have a 10% growth expectation for 2022 and further growth in, in 23. And so again, companies are recovering well, despite higher costs, higher wages, their margins have held up and earnings have been very, very strong. So again, getting back to one of our earlier comments, you know, the shortest recession on history, fastest dip, fastest recovery. Um, couldn't even tell if you look at GDP, probably, you know, when the new numbers come in, we're gonna be back to trend line. And what really drives, as you said, the markets, earnings. I mean, you couldn't even tell COVID had hit if you take that, that, that one year. Yeah, you took out the one year and you put another bar that was up a little right. bit from 20, you, you wouldn't even know there was, was a pandemic. Pretty astounding. And it really does get back to, um, as we transition into a discussion about the markets, that market timing and looking at economic data to make investment decisions can be very misguided. Um, so let's talk about the markets. Um, and let's focus right now on, on last year or last quarter. I know things have shifted a bit with the new year upon us, and we're going to touch on that a little later. But the equity markets last year, performance was pretty outstanding. Um, another year of strong equity performance. So we see here, Q4, pretty much everything positive with the exception of emer emerging markets, uh, just slightly negative. Of course, they're a little bit more negative on a full year basis, but all of the other categories here, we see um, very, very strong performance. Okay. International is not quite as strong as US, but nonetheless, certainly wasn't a bad year, even in the international markets. Now, that's a little different as we transition into a discussion around bonds. Uh, bonds were, say, basically break even to slightly down for the quarter um, and slightly down even for the year, while we had some kind of specialty categories or other categories like commodities um, and REITs for the year that were up quite a lot. And I think that was really inflation related. When we look at REITs, now it had a huge year, but we also have to remember that it actually was one of the worst categories in, in 2020. Good point. When stocks were up a lot, it was actually down 8%. But the interesting thing is uh, just the recovery in, in some of the components, uh, regional malls and shopping centers have recovered, uh, retail, apartments, residential, industrial. Um, obviously, there are some things that haven't done as well. So lodging, not, not surprising. Um, freestanding office, healthcare, um, those have been down. But again, I think this was a kind of recovery year after a, a, a very tough 2020. So we can see here, strong equity returns pretty much across the board. Uh, on the left side, that uh, component, those are all large cap stocks uh, with the various styles, either they're blend, uh, value oriented or growth oriented. Um, blend obviously being a combination of both value and growth. Uh, toward the middle, those uh, segments there are the mid cap. Um, so these are companies that are slightly smaller than, than what we consider to be large cap. And then on the right side, we'll see the small cap. And what I was quasi surprised to see is that small cap value had done so well during the year, almost matching performance of large cap growth. Not quite, uh, but it was, was close, uh, which hasn't happened for a while. It's an interesting dichotomy because when you look at mid cap and small cap, value trounced growth. But when you look in, in um, the large cap area, growth did do a little bit better than value. And there is a reason for that. And, and we'll touch on it now and kind of later. But when you look at the growth market, it's dominated by technology. 
and in fact, it's more than 50% of the weighting. But most of the top 10 companies in the market are growth and technology companies. And we've in talked, large cap, in, in large yeah, cap, yeah. and we've talked about how arguably uh, large cap growth might be overvalued. And so, you know, the markets have changed this mm -hmm. year, and that maybe that's coming down. But that was the factor that really drove large cap growth to outperform large cap value. As we look at the international returns, uh, so the last slide was more US oriented. Um, I had alluded to this earlier, um, although international didn't have a terrible year, um, it wasn't a blockbuster year either. Um, so let's touch on the different regions. So when we look on the left side of the page, things are down. China, uh, Asia, Latin America, again, more than likely, pandemic related, uh, lower vaccination rates, zero COVID policies in much of Asia for manufacturing. So that did weigh on growth and on the markets. So the interesting thing is then when we shift to the right, we're really looking at Europe. And Europe did actually have a very good year relative to the rest of international. Now it didn't do as well as the US. Uh, they were affected a, a bit more by Delta earlier than the U.S. was. They didn't really have the summer we did. But despite that, uh, far outperformed what we see on the left side of the page. So with that, let's transition into a discussion about the bond performance, because I know there's been a lot of conversation around uh, bonds, and we're going to get to uh, the next slide or two on inflation and the impact inflation and rising rates could have on bonds. But looking back for the quarter and uh, for the full year, uh, let's go through the various uh, bond sectors. Well, the biggest issue that uh, really affected bonds this past year was the increase in interest rates. And so when we look at U.S. Treasuries on, on the far right, uh, down 3.6% for the year, up slightly because we did see interest rates come down a little bit in the fourth quarter, again, due to the pandemic, but, but clearly uh, it had an impact on most of the bond sectors. Now, there are really three areas that kind of look different. One would be high yield, and that had a great year, and that really just had to do with spreads, the spread between uh, high yield corporate bonds and treasuries. Those came down because of the recovery that continued in the year, so that did well. Municipals, you know, did well uh, also. I, I was just reading this morning that states are are flush with oh. cash, and I think that had a factor, that when you had a year where other bonds weren't doing as well and people saw the strong fundamentals, I, I think that helped. But, you know, one of the things we've talked about, again, is inflation. Well, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, did the best because of, of, of the high inflation. Uh, so though that really kind of stood out. And one of the things uh, also though, that we did uh, email to our clients last year in the fourth quarter was the fact that the Series I savings bonds also benefited from inflation. And so in fact, uh, the, uh, the yield that they're paying through April is a 7% yield. Yeah, so, so we had suggested uh, our clients consider at least buying uh, some I-series uh, bonds. Doing so through, you have to do it, through the U.S. Treasury uh, direct system. Um, it's limited, so admittedly not all of our clients uh, jumped on the recommendation because uh, for some people it is a bit of a hassle to go through the process of opening an account and buying the bonds online knowing that you can only buy $10,000 worth per person uh, per year. But for those who did that in December, um, this is just a reminder that that is a 10,000 per person per year limit, meaning that now we're in a new year, you can go in and buy another $10,000 worth. So if you're a married couple, uh, you could get $40,000 into these bonds relatively in a short period of time, half in December, half now in January. So let's talk about inflation and rising interest rates specifically. Um, and really, 
Before we talk in detail about inflation and rising interest rates, because it's undoubtedly going to bring us to the discussion around how to, do those items impact bonds and how do they impact equities? Um, I always like to start discussions of this type with conversation around risk profile. Um, and we measure risk profile or person's tolerance for risk using a number of, of factors. Um, the key though is that the result of all these factors is putting together a mix of what you might refer to as risk on assets and some risk off assets, all driven off of each individual investor's risk profile. So remember, not all investors have the same risk profile. This is going to be key as we talk through these other items relating to inflation and rising interest rates, because the equities or the risk on, this is what typically people think of risk on assets, equities, that, Jonathan, I like to explain, that's the engine of the portfolio. That's what makes it go fast, okay? But it can be a rough ride along the way. I mean, if anybody's ever been in a race car, and I've been lucky enough to have, never actually raced it, but I've been in it, driven around the track, and even though those tracks look quite smooth, you're in a race car that can go really fast, it is a rough ride. You feel every bump along the way. And I tell you what, 10 or 15 minutes in that car, my back was sore, I was ready to get out. Um, risk off assets, which a lot of people equate to bonds, those are not the engine. Those are the shock absorber. So they help smooth the ride along the way. Some people, my point being, like the fast car, they can take the rough ride, they don't get a sore back, they could sit in that thing for two, three, four hours. Other folks, they like the smoother ride. Okay, so this is all dependent upon your personal preference and profile. Okay, equities, engine, bonds, shock absorbers. So with that, let's talk about the impact inflation has on long-term returns. Well, looking at uh, this particular page, let's look at kind of the top portion uh, in orange and black. That would be small and large cap stocks. You can clearly see they've done better than everything else. But I think we have to think about it that to get a higher return, you do have to take risk. And so really what we need to think big picture is that stocks are gonna earn higher returns than bonds. And that's clearly what we see uh, on this long-term chart. But let's look at the green, which is inflation, the green line. And then right above that would be teals, uh, so a type of treasury bond, and then bonds in general. Well, guess what? They both over time did better than inflation. And so I think what we have to remember is that we're experiencing high inflation right now, but when we think about inflation's impact on returns long-term, it really hasn't had an impact. Both asset class have performed better over the long term. So this is over the long term. Um, let's just talk about inflation and how it impacts returns between stocks and bonds at different levels. Um, so if we have high inflation, moderate inflation, maybe even very low or negative inflation or deflation, you would refer to it as. Well, right. So let's kind of look at the tails on both sides. So let's start on the right side. So 6% or above. And again, this is a rolling 12-month inflation rate. So uh, it gets a little bit longer in nature, but that's really where we see, see the problems. And so when we look at that, the U.S. equity, which is in light blue, down 4%, uh, fixed income down just a little bit more, but down 4%. If we look at the other side where we don't have inflation and might ac actually have deflation, that also is a, a period uh, where stocks don't do as well. They actually do a little bit worse. Bonds do pretty well. But when you look at really between that zero and 
stock and bond returns do pretty well. Now, now technically, in the two to three percent range where we've been for most of the last 40 years, uh, technically have the highest equity returns, but still very strong equity returns, you know, up to 2% and, and above that 3% level. And bond returns have done um, well during these periods as well. Right. But not as well. But not that gets well. back to they've never been intended as the engine of the portfolio anyway. They are the shock absorber. And we're going to touch on that a little bit further. Let's first, though, touch on the impact increases in interest rates have on bonds because um, you know we hear in the news a lot about how bonds are going to get hammered as the fed shifts their policy and begins to raise rates um, which i wanted to mention you had earlier indicated last year rates had gone up um, just so that everybody knows when we talk about rates going up um, especially last year those are market rates the Fed has not actually raised rates yet. They only control the short end of the yield curve. The Fed funds, it's an overnight rate. And that's still at zero to 0 0.25. But the anticipation is that they're going to begin raising rates this year. So the market kind of reacted in advance. Good point. Okay. But as these rates tend to go up, how do bonds react? And why is it? that if you watch the nightly news or listen to you know whoever it might be some talking head they're talking about bonds just getting hammered why is that the case jonathan well i think it's because the media wants to be a little sensational so they talk about longer term treasury bonds so here we're looking at a two-year five-year 10 and, and 30-year uh, treasury uh, price return so yes if you owned a 30-year treasury you'd be down 20% or even close to 10% uh, if you owned a 10-year treasury. But you know the issue is that most investors and our clients don't own 30-year treasuries. And, and so I, I think it kind of scares people. I think let's look to the right and look at the US aggregate, which is what most bond funds really manage against. And the US aggregate is a collection of different types of bonds it has a high component of treasury bonds, uh, but it has a, a mix. So it doesn't go down as much, but typically even diversified bond funds go down less because during periods of rising interest rates, the managers uh, own far less treasuries. And, and so I think you know that's one of the things uh, that we do have to remember is that most people don't experience those really um, uh, low uh, returns as a result of interest rating increases. Then again, a lot of people own bond funds and the managers have more discretion. They can own shorter duration bonds or short-term bonds. Uh, they can own different types of bonds that don't have as much um, interest rate risk. You know, and, and another thing here, we're showing price versus total return. And we've got to remember that you are getting a yield. Uh, on that. And so the interesting thing is, is if we look at, you know, a yield on the 30 year treasury being the difference between 18% um, uh, and negative 19.8%, so 1.8%, and look at that versus the yield differential on the 10 and 5, it's not as big. That's why people don't own these long term bonds, is they're not getting paid for that risk. At least our clients. I mean, absolutely. Some clients or some, some, People might own them, but our clients certainly don't. And our clients are in positions that have less treasury exposure. They're in positions where the manager can go shorter duration. Uh, we have different types of, of bonds or managers that focus on different types of bonds. As a matter of fact, some of our non-traditional bonds theoretically can go negative duration, uh, which means basically if rates go up where most bonds would go down in value, negative duration bonds go up in value. Um, so the point that, that you've made very clearly is even though people focus on the impact and the negative impact rising rates could have on treasuries, that's just not probably a clear reflection of reality for our investors and clients.
The other thing to keep in mind is that we really haven't experienced that many negative years of bond returns. Um, as a matter of fact, if we look here, going back to 1980, there have been four negative calendar year of bond returns, and we just ended one of those four. Um, otherwise, out of these 42 years, 38 have shown positive bond returns, and that's been even during periods of inflation. Yeah, so here we're showing you the years that had 4% or greater inflation. And so interestingly, those are with the arrows, right? With the yep. red arrows. There's only been one year where we had negative bond returns with higher inflation, and that was in 2021. Really, those periods closer to the 80s where we saw the higher inflation, we actually didn't see negative bond returns. And, and the other thing I found interesting that you pointed out to me, Jonathan, with this slide is that even though only four years ended negative, the average intra-year decline was in that three or 3.2% 3 range. Um, so many years it looks like they'll end negative, but they actually end still in the positive. And, and, and frankly, we could show this chart and be a lot more volatile but we could show this chart um, with the same point on equities. You know, equities have many, many intra-year declines um, of significant magnitude, yet they end the year positive. So let's talk about returns over time. Um, and this is really getting to more of that blend. You got some engine and you got some shock absorber. So why is this uh, chart showing us? This is looking at uh, the range of stock and bond and blended re returns going back to 1950. And so when you look at it on a one-year basis on the far right, uh, left side, you can see that the range for stocks is the widest. Uh, the range for bonds isn't quite as, as wide, but the downside uh, is, is far less than uh, on the stock side. And then with the blend of 50% stock, 50% bonds, uh, you have some downside risk, but just not quite as much. And then if we look at the five, 10 and 20 year rolling basis, um, you basically see the negatives uh, become far less uh, and you still have relatively high returns. But I think that the one thing we really should focus is kind of what is the average during that entire time period. And as we've mentioned, if you want to take, uh, have a higher return, you have to take more risk, and that's where stocks come in. Um, bond returns, far less than, than stocks, but then when you kind of have that blend, um, you get a, a good bit of that, that equity return, but without that downside risk. So, so I almost, listening to us, uh, feel like we're selling bonds. Um, which of course we don't sell anything, uh, but our point is, and I think you just touched on it, right? Equity's the engine, bonds the shock absorber. Some people like smoother rides, some people like to go fast. We're not trying to dictate which is better than the other, um, but we're just trying to show the interplay between the two. Some investors will choose to be heavy equities and they accept those risks. Some people will choose to be maybe more blended like this chart showing. So you get less volatility and therefore less return. That, you know, over time is just pretty much the way it works. So let's talk about this though. Let's talk about bond alternatives. So I know some investors have really been stretching for yields and they've been using what they think to be bond-like investments that maybe aren't really bond-like investments. Um, so what are we showing here, Jonathan? Well, let's look at uh, the yields that you can get. So you can, on the bond side, you can stretch to emerging market and get a much higher yield, high yield, even floating rate bonds. And then some people look at, say, convertibles, right? But actually, the, the uh, yield isn't really that much higher. 
So then we look at preferred stocks, dividend paying stocks, and even REITs where they really are a bit more equity uh, oriented, but you get that higher yield. So the downside though. Yeah, the whole picture though is you have to look at what is what is the yield you're getting for the risk that you're taking. And that's not really talked about much. So even if you look on the bond side, an emerging market high yield floating rate, you're taking much more uh, risk. In this case, we're measuring drawdown, which is taking the most recent high from a performance standpoint to uh, the kind of uh, low point. And so we're looking at 13% declines. And then if we go really to the other side, you're not getting that much more yield, but you're taking equity like uh, downside risk. So preferred and dividend paying stocks, that drawdown is 20%. And in fact, REITs are almost 30%. Yeah. So again, not that these can't be used, but they have to be used going into them, understanding the full picture and not just focus on what we show here in yellow, the yield. Yeah, I think the best way to think about it is investors need to be risk aware. Right. They need to be aware of the risk that they're taking right. and, and comfortable with it. So, you know, we've mentioned that the Fed is uh, on the cusp of raising interest rates probably three times. I've heard as many as maybe four times this year. Uh, what typically happens is the Fed goes through this tightening cycle. Um, what do, on average anyway, equities do? Well, so this goes back to 1950. One of the things that we do know in the last 20 to 30 years is the Fed is into communicating. And so people know their policy ahead of time. And so interestingly, the closer you get to that uh, start of the, the, the tightening, the returns kind of come in. And then once they're kind of in play, uh, raising rates, people become comfortable that it's not gonna cause the economy to go into recession. Then we see the returns uh, come back. So we're probably in that three month prior, maybe six month prior period right now. Would, I mean, they haven't told us exactly, but it, exactly. that's the general yes, thought. Yeah, absolutely. And the impact that a Fed hiking cycle has on bonds, um, let's touch on that. Yeah, so on this page, it's a little complicated, but we're looking at the prior five-year tightening cycles. Uh, not in order, but just kind of looking at it. The thing to glean on, on an average return basis is that 10-year treasuries have had a negative impact. Not Again, not surprising because we showed that 1% impact. But when you look at where the negative returns are, they were in the 99 to 2000 tightening cycle and the 94 to 95. Um, those did have some negative returns, more so in bonds and in some uh, stock areas. But in general, on average, um, we had seen equities up and bonds being the 10-year treasury just modest. But if you look at that two-year treasury, a positive return. And the ag is also yeah. positive, which is that more blended. Absolutely. So, Jonathan, you know what this is. It's your favorite slide. <laughs> I love this slide. Uh, it looks busy, uh, but it, it's really quite easy to follow. Uh, every column is a different year. Every box being a different color and signifying a different type of asset. Um, so, and I'm colorblind, so it kind of uh, works against me in this, but uh, fixed income is is what? Uh, uh, purple, kind of blue? purplish blue. Okay. Uh, so you can see in any given year, like 2008, Great Recession, fixed income did the best. So if it's at the top of the column, that's the best performing. And then it works down to the worst performing at the bottom. Um, the point here, is that it is very difficult to time the best versus the worst in any given year. Look at commodities in 2011 at the very bottom, or at least second from the bottom, and then it spent several years at the very bottom, and then it starts trending up a little bit, but really didn't get up until 2021 when commodities took off. Um, so the 
real key with this scatter plot um, or or however you want to term it is that the asset allocation portfolio the one that's diversified across all of these never does the best but it also never does the worst and it gives you a much smoother ride along the way so again this is a great strategy for those that aren't wanting the necessarily race car feel um, but they still want to have good performance long term so how does that diversified portfolio work over the long term well it's interesting so on the last slide we showed the asset allocation kind of in the middle not very sexy some people would even argue that it's not a strategy it's just sitting on things but on this page i think what we're really going to show you is that balanced portfolios really are a strategy and that they do quite well so that's the blue line on the top okay the middle line the light blue and then the kind of more greenish colors are a little bit more of market timing uh, portfolios one would be a growth momentum so basically the investor buys the strongest performing stocks of the past year the value investor on the other hand is buying the worst performing stocks and over time they're fairly close they've, they've done okay but not anywhere close to the balanced portfolio where um, that portfolio owns both growth and value and so not only is it an allocation diversified across different assets but different strategies and different types of stocks very good point all right with that let's transition into our outlook and we'll start with the U.S. economy. Of course, the expansion continues. Uh, inflation will likely be persistent, uh, but we do expect it to moderate. You know, we were hoping that it might moderate this year, and, and that is still the hope. Uh, but with Omicron and concerns with supply chains again, um, we may need to kind of push our expectations of that moderation out toward the end of the year, or maybe into 2023. There's certainly gonna be less fiscal and monetary stimulus. I mean, that I think is, is a given. We may see a shift in spending, uh, more on services, and that could be a potential driver. And the consumer remains strong. Now we have to be a little bit careful here. Balance sheets look great. But as Jonathan had talked about earlier, um, we have to question um, forward sentiment and consumer expectations, um, particularly, particularly around inflation. Um, that could, even though the consumer has a strong balance sheet, that could maybe have some influence that could be on the not as positive side of the equation. Now, as far as the international economy, uh, walk us through that. So most major countries should see recovery this, this year. Last year, they were a little bit more constrained. Now, Europe was a little bit better than, say, Asia or Latin America. But we do think that it will be more um, uh, widespread this year. Uh, like the US, global fiscal and monetary policy will not be as generous. With one exception. Yes. <laughs> China. Yes. Yes. And, and it's just really amazing to think of the difference of our policy versus what we're seeing in China. Uh, we're on the cusp of raising interest rates. Certainly the market rates have already increased and the Federal Reserve will probably raise this year. China actually is lowering their rates, uh, which looks to be stabilizing their economy. Uh, hopefully we'll stabilize their markets as well because I don't know if people have followed Chinese stocks, but you know, very popular stocks like Yum China down 34% from its one year high, or Alibaba down 50% from its one year high. So hopefully um, what China is doing will help moderate um, some of what's happening in the uh, the markets. And frankly, because they're lowering rates and we're raising rates, that might shift more demand to US bonds, which might help bond performance in the US, 
really in spite of the fact that U.S. rates will be raising um, because typically rates go up, bond prices go down, but there might be a little bit of a demand factor there that could help uh, provide a little uh, more stability to the bond price. That's a great point. So um, as far as the equity markets, Odds of higher volatility in 2022. Now, to our credit, <laughs> we we did talk about that in the fourth quarter, and I, I think we're seeing that right now yeah. uh, as we speak. Um, valuations are high, but they reflect positive expectations. And quite frankly, the, the recovery that we've seen has, has been yeah. very strong. Now, valuations may be not quite as high today as they were on 1231. Uh, we have seen, and everybody knows, markets are down so far this year. Um, growth stocks have taken it uh, a little bit harder. So, you know, broad-based NASDAQ, uh, I don't know why, it's I think it's down today too, but uh, as of last night, it was down 11 to 12%. Um, even popular stocks like Tesla down 18 or, or kind of the stay-at-home stocks like Zoom down 38% or ARC. Uh, if people are familiar with Kathy Woods and, and the ARC innovation, that, that's down 50% from its one year high. Um, and then I was I was reminded, Jonathan, of, of back a year or two ago, so many clients were reaching out to us about uh, canopy growth um, and these uh, cannabis stocks. Uh, well, canopy growth uh, from its one year high is down 81%. Um, so we have seen certainly a uh, more modest pullback in the more diversified strategies like the S&P 500 that's down 6%. And on the flip side, there's even some stocks, maybe even some quote sin stocks that have been, uh, done quite well, like ExxonMobil. It's up 60 some percent uh, over the last year. Uh, so again, we recognize markets shifted a little bit already, uh, but you're going to mention what we typically see in a calendar year. So go through those statistics. Yeah, so interestingly, you know, the pullback that we're seeing right now is actually fairly normal. We didn't really have much last year. And again, I think it was because of all the fiscal and monetary support. But in an average year, you get three, 5% pullbacks. And then we get a 10% pullback in the market on average every 18 months. And so again, one of the things that I'd say is that earnings growth for this year provides support. So it doesn't seem like the, the pullback that we're having is really a broader signal about the economy. I think this is just one of those normal pullbacks that we just haven't experienced mm -hmm. in, in the last couple and of years. You never know when these pullbacks are gonna happen and the catalyst of them, it's impossible to forecast. Um, we can always look back and, and argue what the catalyst was, but yeah, this is just part of the investing cycle. Now, I am reminded um, as we think about bonds that yields are going to be increasing. Um, future returns will probably be more modest as a result, but as we talked over the last uh, 30 or 40 minutes about they still can provide that risk off protection. So I hate to even bring it up, Jonathan, but this is an election year. Um, and in election years, tell us what we typically see. Yeah, so being a midterm election year, um, this is not a statement on how high the returns will be or how low they'll be. This is just a, a, a slide showing you how the performance on average has occurred during the year. And clearly what we can see is in that May to October time period, the markets are flat to down and actually have quite a bit of volatility. And then sometime in October ahead of the election, people realize that the world isn't gonna end if one party does something you know, in the elections versus the other. Um, that certainty that it's gonna be over and that things will be fine, tends to then drive the markets higher into the end of the year. So with that, let's talk about the new year planning tips and our updates. And I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly. I'll pull them all up here on the slide. 
Um, clearly don't adjust your risk tolerance through the recent market performance. Whether it was at the end of the year, trying to adjust because the markets were doing so well, or whether it's now trying to adjust because the markets aren't doing as well. Um, stay consistent, the strategy works. Jonathan showed us a slide proving that today. Um, of course, don't forget about tax time, it's coming up. Uh, make sure if you've got any foreign accounts, you're reporting those appropriately. And start planning for 2022, which means keep good records. Great time to do that. Um, review your spending, utilize HSAs, review Social Security and your estate documents, make sure your beneficiary designations are up to date, right? Rebalance your portfolios. Of course, our clients were doing that for now. Make sure you have proper insurance. We don't sell insurance. Just make sure you're properly covered though. If it's been a while, get a copy of your credit reports. Consider freezing your credit. And as an FYI, um, if you take required minimum distribution from your IRAs, and again, our clients don't really have to worry about this because we do this for them, but there is a new life expectancy table that was issued. Um, and it will result in fewer dollars having to come out of your IRA for the year. So if you're calculating this on your own, don't use the table that you had been using in prior years. It's different this year. As far as our updates, uh, performance. Touch on that real quick, Jonathan. So again, a great year for equities. Uh, I think really what stood out was our value funds did exceptionally well on an absolute basis and relative basis. And when we look at our, our growth uh, funds, they generally had positive performance, not as good relative performance, but I will remind you that they had exceptional performance in 2020. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that we've seen is some of these high flying uh, stocks have come down. And I think that was uh, maybe a factor in that. When we look at international, uh, generally our, our um, uh, funds did very, very well on an absolute basis relative to other international uh, returns as well. Maybe you could argue that international growth was a little bit weaker, but again, had an exceptional performance in 2020. And of course, the other updates that we have, um, I'm excited to report, we have a new executive assistant on our team, Meglis. Uh, some of you may have already uh, spoken with Meglis as she's taking over uh, these responsibilities and coordinating meetings with clients or at least for some of our advisors. Um, we also have three team members who are transitioning into new roles. Uh, we love to promote from within and to transfer uh, individuals from certain roles to new roles to keep them uh, challenged and learning new things and uh, we've been blessed to be able to do that for three of our uh, team members here more recently which means we're in search for three new team members. Um, so that's always exciting to see us uh, growing and we can uh, really accommodate that growth now that we're in our new office space too, uh, which has been a nice transition. So with that, I would like to uh, encourage you if you have any additional questions or even topics you want us to touch on in the future, uh, reach out to your Silver Oak advisor if you're not working with an advisor, I've given you here my phone number, 952-896-5701. Otherwise, again, Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for the rest of the Silver Oak team in making this possible. And thank you for all of those in attendance. We greatly appreciate it and wish you a great day.